Thank you. We appreciate Metro Waters hosting the Speakers Forum. My name's Mikhail Houghton. I'm with the Cumberland River Compact, and uh, I'm going to talk through a few short slides and then turn the program over to Alan Forkham, who is um, the editor of the Nashville Retrospect, the historical newspaper. So uh, as I said, I'm with the Cumberland River Compact, and um, our Mission is to protect the Cumberland River and its tributaries. Uh, this map is an early map um, from the settlers of, of Nashville. And you can see the Tennessee River uh, flowing south. And so the um, Donaldson party uh, came with the women and children and they took flatboats down the Tennessee River and the men came across land uh, with the Robertson party. That little star represents Nashville. And this is how Nashville was settled uh, when the women and children hit the confluence with the Ohio River, they ended up um, poling upstream in their flatboats until the parties were reunited um, in Nashville. This is a picture of the flatboats that were used to, to bring settlers to uh, Nashville. And this is a sculpture that uh, represents the reunification of the two um, parties. And quickly, within three weeks of these two parties uh, meeting in Nashville, the Cumberland Compact was signed. And the, there was no government in Nashville at the time, so the Cumberland Compact represented a peaceful way for people to uh, settle mostly land disputes. So if you, here's the Cumberland River Basin, which is, um, as I said, the mission of our organization to work to improve water quality. Um, it's 18,000 square miles. The Cumberland River itself is about 700 miles long, and uh, 40% in Kentucky, 60% in Tennessee, and two and a half million people depend on this river for their survival. So if, if we go to 1996, um, a man named Vic Scoggin worked at the Aladdin Glass Plant. He had 65 days of vacation. He was a passionate lover of the river, and he thought to himself, what can I do with 65 days of vacation? Uh, and he thought, well, if he swam about 11 miles a day, he could swim the whole length of the Cumberland River. He uh, had an advance team that would bring um, newspapers to the river as he was swimming it, and in that way, draw attention to the polluted state of the Cumberland River. So he started in the headwaters in Harlan, Kentucky, and swam about 11 miles a day. Um, and was very successful in attracting news media to the, to the Cumberland River and its polluted state. And when he swam through Nashville, uh, the, a, a future board member, Bill, Bill Forrester, saw him, asked what he was doing, and so began the Cumberland River Compact. Uh, so in that way, Vic's mission succeeded in inspiring many local Nashvilleans to start the Cumberland River Compact. Our mission since 1997 has been to enhance the health and enjoyment of the Cumberland River and its tributaries through collaboration, action, and education. Uh, so we partner with many, many organizations. Uh, we enjoy a strong partnership with Metro Water to educate citizens to improve water quality. And we recently moved into this space in the bridge building on da uh, Nashville's downtown riverfront. And in Allen's uh, slideshow, you'll see how this space has fared through the years as a riverfront property. So um, it, also in this space, we host River Talks, um, which is how we came to know Alan through his, uh, his presentations uh, on history of the riverfront and Nashville. So it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Alan. Thank you. Hi, thank you, McCabe. Um, this presentation is um, called The Floods Have Come Again. And I noticed some people here from Metro Water Services, if you were at the Cumberland Compact a few weeks ago, you may have seen this presentation. Does this automatically advance to the next slide or not? Oh, 
Pardon me. Oh, it's open? Down here somewhere? Yeah. Thank you. I don't use a PC enough to know what I'm doing with it. Um, uh, as Mikhail said, my name is Alan Forkham. I'm the editor and publisher of the Nashville Retrospect newspaper, which is a monthly newspaper here in Nashville that you can uh, purchase at uh, local grocery stores. We've been publishing for about six years now and just basically reprint old news from Nashville's past as well as historical essays. Uh, just a quick acknowledgement of some of the people uh, who provided and institutions who provided uh, information and slides for this. Library of Congress here, the Nashville Public Library, Metro Archives, uh, images from them, Metro Water Services, been very helpful. The State Library, the Corps of Engineers, and the U.S. Geological Society. I uh, gave this talk on the occasion of the uh, fifth anniversary of the 2010 flood. And uh, at the time of that flood, I think uh, me, like a lot of people, were caught off guard by it and didn't really expect it. And we had been doing this newspaper for about a year, and I'd been going through old newspapers for about a year, and had come across a few floods, but hadn't really studied that subject. So after the flood, I decided to, for the June of that year, go back through all the old newspapers I could that mentioned floods and basically did a technique where I leapfrog back from one flood to the next, because invariably, when there's a bad flood, they refer back to the one prior and compare it, see whether or not it was worse. So I learned uh, quite a few things uh, doing this. Uh, I learned that there have been a number of big floods in Nashville's history, and also learned that uh, Nashville is a river city. Now, this seems obvious, but it wasn't. To me, I'd lived downtown for a few years, and of course there was a river there, but to me it was more like a water feature than it really was anything else. Didn't really think of it as being a part of the city like it had been in the past. And of course, it had very much been. The whole reason the city is here is because of the river. Uh, in the newspaper coverage, this one's from 1824, uh, it was even referred to as the Port of Nashville. So the newspapers in the 19th century would regularly report what was going on the river, uh, going on on the river. Steamboats were critical, critical to the uh, economy and even to information. Newspapers were carried from town to town via the steamboats. So uh, the old papers had what they call exchanges where they would get newspapers and republish what was in the other newspapers and just exchange the information. Here you can see where the uh, have arrivals, departures. Um, this picture is circa 1873, shows the riverfront, what we, today we call the riverfront. You can see the steamboats. This is around 1900, still very much a steamboat city. And notice the depth is how much shallower it is compared to that. That constant fluctuation made an impact on, on the travel of these boats in the shallow areas. And this picture is 1927. Now this is the river terminal, the rail and river term terminal that was near the end of Broad Street on the riverfront. So you can see as late as 27, there's still steamers. There's still um, very much a part of Nashville's life, the river is. And by the way, I ran across an article about that crane right there recently uh, from the 50s and it had been refurbished in the 40s in order to keep that business going. And they actually had a name for it, it's called Old Betsy. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Nashville's geography because, and how that plays into Nashville's flooding history. And I'm going to show you a few, go through a few maps and work through Nashville's history with maps, and then we'll go back and look at some floods. This is one of the older maps, 1786, not long after the settlements, uh, settlers arrived in 1780. And you'll notice uh, the French Lick. Um, that was a salt lick, a sulfur spring there, and that creek came to be known Lick Branch. But there's also one down on the bottom here, and that was known as Wilson Spring Branch. Uh, the main thing I want to point out there is how prominent it, those are displayed on the map, and the succeeding maps we see as we move through time, you'll see how prominently they're featured on every map. Again, to the right, you've got the Lick Branch, <clears throat> and on the left is the Wilson Springs. I thought this map dramatically emphasized the, the importance of the prominence of the, uh, of the creeks at the time. 
This one's 1833 map. It's one of the first ones that get uh, into a lot of detail, um, especially on a survey level. If we zoom in, we see on the right side there was Wilson Springs. That was on one of the settlers was named Wilson, so that's how that got his name. And on the other side, the north side of town, we've got the Sulphur Spring. It goes all the way to the river up there. Another map, I flipped it here to maintain the orientation so it's not too confusing to you. We're just going to work through the years here, 1860. This map eight, is sometime after 1862, after the Union Army occupied Nashville. They actually did a topographical map of the city. And this uh, very well shows, you see Capitol Hill, uh, there is the Capitol, and how the land falls away to the north of it and also to the south, where both of those creeks are. And this uh, is an 1888 map, and we start to see something happen to these creeks. They start to be buried. Of course, the creeks, they weren't just creeks, little pretty brooks running through the city. They were pretty much the sewage where everything flowed, and it got very uh, nasty and became a disease problem. So they, uh, part of the solution in the late 1800s was to bury them. And so they slowly built first tunnels um, like this one. This is, you can see, it's called the Lick Branch Sewer. This is looking from the slough out to the river. And they gradually, over time, buried all of uh, those two creeks. This is the Wilson Springs Creek branch, rather. So by the, by the time they're drawing that 1908 map, this is the uh, Lick Branch sewer. It's completely covered up. Uh, it's not even, there's no creek showing anymore. This is a mid-50s picture. You can see the LNC Tower in the background is under construction. It was completed in 57. And this uh, pipe here is the outlet for the Lick Branch sewer. That's Kerrigan Ironworks, the big building on the left. You can see the stockyards in the background. Those uh, Kerrigan Ironworks would eventually be turned into the riverfront apartments. Now, to give you an idea of how oblivious someone can be of local history, I lived in these apartments for four years. I drove over this spot here every day, twice a day probably for two years, and had no idea its connection to Nashville's history, the, the fact that that creek was connected to the Sulphur Springs, which uh, I, didn't, I forgot to mention, but if you don't know, the, they attracted the game, which attracted the long hunters and eventually the settlers to this area. And to, that was the Lick Branch sewer. To jump back to the Wilson Springs sewer, this is the mid, uh, late 60s. They were not able to uh, modify that sewer. They had to actually drill a new tunnel. So <clears throat> they have a, uh, um, there's an article that's been done about that was given to me by Metro Water Services that shows the, the work that they did there in order to capture more of the water that would come into that low spot and help prevent flooding of downtown businesses. So here we jump to 2015, and there's basically no sign of the Wilson Springs here, all underground, but there's a little indication of something to the north there. Does anybody know what that is, that wiggly line? Because it happens to be right close to where the creek was. That is a greenway, and if we look at a satellite map and zoom in a little, you can see that that this greenway looks very similar to the creek. The reason for that is because that is where this old sewer line is and uh, zoning restrictions prevent anything from being built on top of it due to, the, uh, uh, due to the fact that the old sewer is underneath. So literally that building is cut in half there uh, where uh, the sewer is underneath. But it also affects new construction. As you can see, this is where the baseball stadium is being built, has been completed. This is an artist's rendering of it. You can see the squiggly line, the greenway running through it. It actually was the farthest out they could build, and uh, that in Jackson Street. So it is more or less trapped in that area. It can never be any bigger. Um, they're going to have, I think, historical information down there about, about the greenway. But uh, we saw a presentation, another one that they did at the Cumberland Compact which has a wonderful series of lectures, by the way, so I highly recommend you look it up. One of them was by the contractor who was building the stadium, and he happened to mention that everything that's critical in the construction is built two feet above the 2010 flood crest. I think this includes electrical 
rooms and anything critical. Now, why would that be? Well, this is that same piece of property in 1937. It is in the what was called the Lick Branch Depression. The, what I showed you on the map, north of the city is a low spot, just like south of the city. So even though it's deeper, uh, even though the ground is higher there than it was or when Nashville was settled, it's still lower than the surrounding land. 1948, Cumberland Up Creek by Fred Russell, he was a local sports writer, referring to the uh, Sulphur Dell land it flooded regularly. This is 1963. There's a picture of, of the infield flooded. So it's obvious that Nashville has had a history of flooding. It was to me, especially after going through all these newspapers. So what I wanted to do is take a look now at some of the floods uh, throughout Nashville's history and how they have, uh, and how they might relate to the flood of 2010. When I, as I mentioned earlier, when I started doing the research, I did this sort of leapfrog technique where I just found an article that mentioned a flood, go back and look at the earlier one. Had I been smart enough to ask a librarian, I probably would have been directed to this book, which is Cumberland River Floods Since the Settlement of the Basin with Special Reference to Nashville, Tennessee by S.A. Weekly. Mr. Weekly was born in 1887, and he got an engineering degree in uh, 1911. He eventually, uh, in um, uh, at the same time, he joined the Corps of Engineers. So he studied, st he worked with them through the uh, World War I, and while he was in his 40s, went back to Vanderbilt to get his civil engineering degree. And it was at that time that he wrote this book. This is his thesis uh, that he submitted to get his degree. Uh, he was awarded his degree, and copies of this thesis were hardbound and put in local libraries. This particular copy is in the state library. And what you can see here, which I found fascinating, was that he would go back through the years and update and correct information that was in the book. And here you can see where he's dated the corrections. The Tennessee library con copy that I looked at, state library copy, is dated 64. He was 77 years old when he made those corrections. So uh, this is the type of thing that's in the book. What, how, what month has the most flooding, you think, in, that, in, in the area? Um, we might have thought May. Turns out it's March. Now, all these floods, are, again, are up till 1935. Meteorological information. And then, of course, he, has, he compiled as much information as he could on all the crest, the highest flood stage of, of every major uh, flood event in Nashville's history from 1935 prior. Now, where do they get that information? Uh, I'm actually not certain where he got some of the early information on the earliest floods. I do know that uh, the bridge that you see here to the right was completed in the early 1820s and a man by the name of Greenwood Payne operated the bridge, uh, it was a toll bridge. And he kept records uh, uh, by marking the piers as to how deep it was. So some of the information comes from there. Later, well, we put gauges in, of course. This particular gauge is at, called the Broad Street gauge. And that's where most of the Nashville measurements are taken. You can see the bridge building in the background, which is where the Cumberland River Compact is today. So look, knowing that, let's take a look at some floods. 1793. Now, it's not a best way to tell a story because this is the biggest that we have on a record. 58.5 foot crest. And at the time he did this and figured out this depth, it was, it was and remains the deepest one. So, uh, some of the information um, came from sources like this, Governor Blunt, uh, talking, to, uh, has, had written a letter explaining the delay of a messenger due to uh, the river being very high for many days, nine feet above, above what was ever heretofore known. And also um, comments from original settlers. In this case, uh, it's um, a Colonel Weekly, believe it or not, an ancestor of Mr. Weekly who wrote the book saying in March 93 was the most remarkable fresh ever known in Cumberland. Now, fresh is another word for flood as well as freshette.
1808, another flood. This one is a 54-foot crest. Uh, the Cumberland River presented one of the grandest appearances ever witnessed in the Western country, which would not have failed of pleasing were it not for the certainty that hundreds of our fellow citizens are and want experiencing the destructive effects of its overflowings. Now this would be, this is 1808, it was the earliest newspaper account I could find of a flood here in Nashville, and this is the theme through every newspaper article after this, is it how it's affecting the people who live near the river and in the lowlands around Nashville. Now, this most often was poor people because the land, knowing that it flooded, people didn't build nice buildings there. There's a good reason the Ryman Auditorium and the uh, Custom House and all that aren't low where the skimmer, skimmer horn is. <laughs> Uh, which flooded in 2010. That area was known as Black Bottom because of the dark soil that gathered in that area. So from, and it was also a poor area. So both north of the city and south of the city were very, very um, poor areas that would inevitably be affected by any flooding. 1826, uh, the river has risen to a height seldom known before. An immense extent of the country on both sides is overflowed and much damage has been done by the carrying away of fences, produce, and even houses. Nashville is converted into a peninsula, the low grounds both above and below being inundated. Now I put this in here because when I first read this uh, back in 2010, I, I thought, how could it be a peninsula? I did, did not understand how Nashville could be a peninsula, but hopefully you have a better idea now that I've showed you those maps, those two creeks, that all floods around it, so Nashville becomes this little peninsula sticking out into a, a vast area of water. 1842, the floods have come again, nothing uncommon. 1847, here's one of the uh, earlier art early articles that points out that more than 100 families have been compelled to forsake their houses and seek shelter elsewhere. The poor of our city who have been driven from their homes by the backwaters are suffering much. Uh, this was so noticeable then that uh, the uh, city government felt compelled to offer some relief and they passed a, um, an act whereby $500 were set aside for the uh, victims of this particular flood. And that was March 1847. Turns out same year, December, we had another major flood. This one was almost 55 foot crest. So, and it was about five feet deeper than the one prior to that. And uh, one notes in particular says the, uh, the rapidity of the flood is without precedence. And I, I'm assuming this is uh, similar to our flood in 2010. This, a lot of rain very quickly uh, caused this particular flood. Again, 1847, um, I'm sorry, I lost my place there. This one notes that steamboats are now moored in Broad and Water Streets. Water Street was First Avenue, so the boat, boats are actually up, to bro up in Broad Street at, at, in this particular year. 1850, as a 53-foot crest, this might be the first, uh, it is the first one I can find. I don't know if it's actual first death related to the flood, but a man named Yost, who was a milkman, tried to drive his wagon across a stream on the road. Uh, and uh, it says a horse and wagon sunk, and then he disappeared. And I, one thing I thought was interesting about that is even to this day, uh, vehicular deaths are a, a common occurrence when and during flooding and during flash flooding. Still happens, in fact, I think there were two victims in, in 2010 who drowned uh, in their cars, or in car-related incidents, anyway. Now, 1862, there happens, I could find no newspaper accounts for 1862. That is because at that time uh, of that flooding occurred, the city was being uh, about to be occupied by the Union Army. So there was a great panic once the forts fell north of the city, and uh, every, well, lots of people left, and a lot of newspaper editors left, all of them, I guess, in fact, uh, and because newspapers stopped publishing. <coughs> but Harper's covered it with this and did this drawing of uh, Fort Henry, which uh, is on the Tennessee River, was actually flooded to the point where you could 
float a boat into the fort. Now, uh, I'm assuming that the same flood event that affected the Tennessee also affected the Cumberland because they happened at the same time. Um, but I have to admit, I'm not certain of that. And curiously, the next major flood was in 1865 at the end of the war. So the first flood happened right at the beginning, literally when Nashville was being occupied at that moment. The next one happened a few weeks before the end of the war. And uh, they were very, very close uh, with the, within fractions of an inch of the same crest. Uh, this shows how the coverage has changed a little bit. Here we see descent on, Mucky, on a smoky row. The editors um, got a kick out of the fact that the flooding uh, forced uh, the houses of prostitution to be evacuated and the military arrested quite a few of the, uh, of the women who were working there. So we jump to 1874, uh, down she goes. I mean, there's so many floods, they start coming up with different types of headlines to, to talk about them. This is, uh, I think, the earliest photo of a flood in Nashville, certainly of the, that I have found uh, on the, uh, found this one on the internet. It wasn't even labeled a flood. It was labeled a Civil War uh, image, but I'm pretty sure this is from the 1870s. But in it, you can see a, a steamboat there on the river, and you can see the water in North Nashville. So this is not exactly where the uh, new baseball field is, but it's close to it. And you can also see the roads were bridges also over some of these low areas where they would eventually bury it completely. So uh, presumably now somewhere at that level is probably where the road is or a little higher today. 1882, a 55.3 foot crest. This is another uh, one of Nashville's major floods. Uh, this picture was printed in the newspaper, which is why it doesn't look very good, but that's the suspension bridge, what well, is uh, in the location of today's Woodland Street Bridge. And the light area to the right is the parking lot for the uh, Titan Stadium. It was um, another, uh, like I said, another major flood. Again, we can see 200 families abandon their homes, it says. The Raging Rivers, the headline. Thousands of houses more or less underwater. Now, I'm skipping quite a few floods. I think you're getting an idea of how frequently flooding occurred uh, in Nashville prior to the dams being built. I'm including this one here. I don't think it was particularly deep, 48 feet, 48.2 actually. Now, 40 is considered flood stage, and they measured flood stage, uh, I think, by that's the level it would start affecting crops in some areas, uh, not necessarily in the city, but Anything above 40 is considered a flood. But I included this because of the picture. So here we see North Nashville. And as we pan around here, we see the Jefferson Street Bridge. You can see the railroad bridge there a little bit behind the smokestacks. That's the courthouse in the foreground. And we pan over here to what was known at the time as the Sparkman Bridge. And you can see the bridge building there uh, in the foreground, well, in the, by the bridge. In the background there is, is General Hospital, by the way. So we move from there again. Uh, we're in the photographic era where they start to be more and more common. So I'm going to not show you any more clippings, just show you photographs. The next major one is 1926, 56.2 foot crest. This one is very well documented. And I think this photo really captures the extent of how bad flooding can be in Nashville. There's hardly a spot there that doesn't have water in it, except for Capitol Hill in the lower left-hand corner. But anything you see that's light is flooded. That's the Jefferson Street Bridge there. So keep in mind what we're looking at is the Lick Branch Depression again. This is where the old creek ran, where the Sulphur Spring was. And um, the apartments that I showed you where I lived are up there right by the bridge. That's where that outlet is for the sewer, storm sewer. Panning around, we see the railroad bridge to the left, the Spartan Bridge to the right. And if we zoom in, now this is the down here. If we zoom in, that's the river terminal building that I showed you earlier that had the big crane, old Betsy. And notice the two steamers there. This is a view from First Avenue. They really would have been going, could have gone partway up Broadway had it not been for the uh, utility lines there. 
Now this photograph was taken by a Tennessean photographer, a Nashville Tennessean photographer, and they were compiled into a, a not a souvenir book, it was a, a, a memorial book, I guess you could say, and uh, sold sometime after the 1926 flood. But it, it pretty extensively had pictures of the event. Here you can see the uh, building collapse. This is the foot of the Sparkman Bridge, which was, uh, we know more as Shelby Street Bridge, or at least I do. <laughs> Uh, a human interest story, four puppies were saved from buildings. But there were real refugees. This is Christmas cheer became a Christmas drear for these. It happened on Christmas Day, uh, started right through that era, uh, that time period went on into the new year. And there were two deaths associated with it. Again, they happened to be vehicular. A man and his wife were tried to cross a road that was flooded and both were drowned. The foot of the Sparkman Street Bridge. Now, keep in mind, this reaches all the way to Fourth Avenue, to give you an idea. And this is on the low spot south of the city. So it's not Fourth Avenue you know, up the hill, but south of the city, it reached that far. Today, this bridge does not reach that far. It's a walking bridge. It drops down to second, I believe. This is East Nashville. Broad Street, again, showing the extent of the flooding. Now, there was a song, uh, there was another big flood that same year. April of 27, the Mississippi River flooded. In fact, the flooding that happened here earlier that same year, 26, 27, contributed to the flooding of the Mississippi along with some other floods. And about that time, this song got very popular, Backwater Blues, because of the Great Mississippi Flood. It was recorded and written by a woman named Bessie Smith. Now, for years, it was assumed that this was associated with the Great Mississippi Flood, because that's when it got popular. But it turns out, uh, due to some research by a Vanderbilt music historian by the name of David Evans, he discovered that uh, Bessie Smith was in Nashville during the 1926-27 flood of Nashville. She arrived by train and had to take a boat to the venue, which was the Bijou Theater, which used to be, uh, which is roughly the area of Municipal Auditorium today. She got there, there was a funeral home nearby where some refugees were taking uh, uh, refuge, and they asked her, they knew her it was as a singer, and asked her to sing a song about the flood or flooding, and there weren't, were none that she knew, so she wrote one. Recorded it uh, a few weeks later, and that became the song that became popular and associated with the uh, great flood of the Mississippi in 27. When it turns out, its origins are actually in Nashville. Now we'll go through, through some other, quickly through some other modern floods. This is 1939. This is the Woodland Street Bridge, by the way. It was a suspension bridge earlier, then it became this double iron bridge. Today it is a, uh, uh, just a regular span bridge. Another picture of North Nashville flooded. Another great shot, that's the River Terminal building. Again, this is First Avenue, Riverfront, Second Avenue. And, of course, more refugees. 39, there was another one just two years later. This is North Nashville. This is East Nashville. Here you can see Shelby Park. Uh, these are the baseball fields underwater. And then there's this picture, which I found, uh, this series of pictures I found at the State Library. Um, didn't, uh, didn't know what this was when I first saw it. It turns out these men in the picture are fishing. Quite a few fish became trapped in the, uh, as the water receded, and the fishermen took advantage of this, and got all the carp and catfish they could possibly pick up. Now the caption said that these were commercial fishermen, and certainly these look like it, but I'm pretty sure that guy is just uh, get, getting dinner. 48, now this is uh, the same year that uh, Fred Russell wrote about the uh, Sulphurdale flooding. This is East Nashville here, 1950. That's East Nashville. 
That's not a terribly flooded picture, but I, I like the kids in the bus looking out of the back window of that bus at the photographer. In a duck boat or an amphibious vehicle rescuing more people. 1957. Now, we didn't have the formal ambulance services, the rescue services like we have today, so that is a Phillips and Robertson funeral home boat arriving to rescue someone. So they often would use their, uh, they were often the first responders at scenes were the funeral homes. I don't know if that would be very encouraging to have a funeral home show up to rescue you, but uh, that's what they did. More refugees. And we're going to jump to 1975. Okay, the frequency of flooding drops dramatically after the dams uh, are completed. This, uh, they do a great job of keeping a lot of this little flooding that, we've, that we got over the years. So it was, I, don't, I think there were very few, if any, I don't know if anything reached flood stage in the 60s. But in 75, of course, we had the flood that, if any of you are longtime residents, uh, may remember. I do because I used to go to Opryland at that time as a kid and um, remember it being flooded. That is Old Hickory Dam uh, during this flood. You can see how high the river is compared to the water behind the dam. Presumably it did a similar thing in 2010. There's Cornelia, Cornelia Fort Airport, Air Park. And then here's Opryland. That's an AP photo that was sent out over the wire. Now, this is not a color picture from 75, is it? No. This is 2010. So let's talk a little bit now about 2010. I think you, hopefully you get an idea of flooding was very common for, for many, many decades in Nashville's history. But yet 2010 was very surprising. But it was still a large flood. However, a 51.86 foot crest. You've heard some of the other crests I've mentioned. That doesn't seem that high. But it's important to remember that a crest is not the only way floods are measured. 11 people were killed in Davison County in May 2010. 68,000 individuals and families requested federal aid. And over $2 billion in damages were done. So Nashville, the flood we experienced in 2010 may not have been the highest crest we have, but it is definitely one of the most disastrous, certainly in terms of lives and property. But it could have been worse. Um, the Corps of Engineers put out this map to show the extent of the flooding uh, uh, as, it, uh, as it actually happened. But if they'd lost control at Old Hickory, Lock and Dam, it would have, this is what it might have looked like. And you can see, if you'll remember, in the 1826 article, Nashville was described as a peninsula. This gives you an idea of why. You can see all the water surrounding the city. And had you been up there, you would have it looked like a lake, kind of like it did in that 1926 photo. So where does 2015 flood fit into the historical context? So let's look at it here. This is the photo from 1950 showing the Broad Street, ga Broad Street gauge. And I've plotted on there the four big floods, four biggest floods uh, historically that we've had. And there's, th these are the, happen to be the biggest. There are some close to the 1847 flood, but I, I narrowed it down to these four because these were the ones most often mentioned in, in the newspaper accounts. Where does 2010 fit in? Well, as a crest, it's down here pretty low. But we have to keep in mind that unlike all these other floods, we had dams in. The Corps of Engineers estimated, I've heard two estimates, between five and six feet higher had there been no dam system or had they lost control of the dams. So if we factor that in, that puts 2010 right up near the worst flood that has ever been recorded in Nashville's history. So that's how much water they were dealing with. But can any of this information tell us anything about future floods? I mean, they're working on a, a flood wall downtown. There's things like that. Was, and does it, how do we put it in any sort of context? Was it a 100-year flood, a 500-year flood, a 1,000-year flood? We heard a lot of that spoken about during, at that time. In fact, I think the Corps said that they called the rain event a 1,000-year rain event. But I don't know if they meant that that was a thousand year flood event because there are all kinds of different rain events that can happen. 
Well, I don't know the answer to that question, but fortunately, uh, Samuel Weekly, who wrote the thesis paper I referred to earlier, uh, he had some speculation about that. And here's what he had to say. At Nashville, under natural conditions, during every century, we may expect to experience several floods reading about 55 feet on the gauge, and probably one or more floods reading 60 feet on the gauge. So he had the data he needed to make uh, the several floods prediction, because he had 150 years of history to look at. But he went on a limb a little bit to say that we would get one every century near the 60-foot range. There had been one, by their uh, estimates, which was 1793 if we want to let 58 and a half feet be close to 60 feet. But if 2010 without the dam control was in that same area, then I think he got pretty close to being right about it being a once in a hundred year flood. So if he got that right, what did he have to say about other floods? In other words, that he's just talking here about that particular part on the range. Well, it turns out that he also studied maximum floods of rivers. And there are some floods for which we have centuries of data in other parts of the world. And they've come up with formulas to try to figure out when that, when that might occur. Keep in mind, Nashville only has about 200 and some odd years of flood history recorded. Obviously, other floods has hap have happened, but we know nothing about them. So here's what he had to say about that. Over a period of several centuries, a flood reading 62 and a half feet on the gauge may occur. And probably once in a period of many thousands of years, an all-time maximum flood of at least 67 and a half feet on the gauge will occur. Now, that's pretty scary. And my graphic here uh, is probably a little scary, too. But it's also a little misleading. First of all, I don't, I'm not showing you the entire scale here. There's 50 feet you can't see here. So this is, because I couldn't fit it on there, on there, you're only seeing what's relevant to what I'm talking about. So those are a lot closer together if you see the whole scale. Also, we do not have the dams figured into this. But if we put in the dam information and shave off five or six feet, it still puts an all-time maximum flood in the 62 feet range, which would translate into about a story deeper downtown than it was in 2010. So I think uh, if we look at his conclusion, it seems evident from every angle of approach that no great flood has occurred in the Cumberland River in the past 155 years, or basically since the settlement of Nashville. So what he's saying, basically, we haven't seen the worst that's possible. Now, he's not saying the worst is definitely going to happen, but worse is possible than we have seen. And how does he figure that? Well, one way he did it is he looked at the 1882 flood, which was a large flood, the 1926-27 flood, and he looked at the rain that fell in those periods. In both cases, there were three different storm systems with a day separating each one. He said you take out that day, if the systems had just come together at the same time in a shorter period, one was 10 days, one was 12 days of rain, you would have had a much worse flood. And, and so in 2010, what do we have? Two, maybe three days of rain? And he also said of one of those floods, I can't remember which, it wasn't even particularly heavy amounts of rain. It was just a lot of rain over a long period of time. So there are f different things that can lead to a possible flood. And so his conclusion, again, was that looking at all time, at formulas used to calculate all time maximums, then Nashville uh, could experience much worse. So are there any conclusions uh, that we can draw from any of this? Any definite conclusion? I say yes. You know, um, I joked when, at the, at, when I gave this presentation at the bridge building that you probably don't want to be here if it rains for a few days straight because it seems to flood every time uh, uh, there's a bad, bad, bad flooding. But we also need to remember that Nashville is a river city. We need to remember it on the anniversary and in the future is remembering the people who lost their lives and the property that was lost. The floods will come again. It's only a matter of when and how deep. Thank you very much.